it was kind of funny because today I was listening to Chuck Missler. Just happened. It always goes right on the thing that I'm going to be teaching or something. He was talking about Luke 17:37. You know, you know, one's taken, one's left. And the disciples asked them, "Where, Lord?" And it says, "Well, where the body is, there the vultures will gather." And it was very confusing to him because he took the, I would say, typical line of thought: one taken, one left is the rapture, right? And then when he cross-referenced Luke, he's like, this is a very puzzling verse, you know, because it doesn't seem to fit. Well, it doesn't fit because he put the rapture in there. So he was like, oh, I don't know what it is. It might be the body, the body of Christ, and the vultures could be eagles, and, you know, we're raptured to where heaven is or something like that. Even he said, like, yeah, that's kind of lame. You know, he wasn't satisfied with that. Because he had that thing in his mind that when it says no man knows the day or the hour, that it has to refer to the rapture. Okay? And so that kind of messed him up in his interpretation. I mean, still, obviously, he had a lot of good stuff in there. Um, Matthew 24. So we went through there where he went through the whole tribulation period, right? Mm -hmm. And then he went, you know, the model of no one taken, one left, and... One left behind, one left, like two men are in the field, in the bed, grinding at the mill, one taking one left. All right. Then, and context of that, in verse 42, after one's taken and one's left, he says this, Therefore be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. What verse are you in? Uh, 24, 42. Thank you. Okay, so, the one taken, one left, is in conjunction with no man knows the day or the hour, all right? So what I want to do is just quickly trace that through because there is a line of thought that as we go through the parables, it goes up, it's going to, he's going to tell a parable, then another parable, then another parable. We're going to see a pattern. Then we're going to get to the actual event that he's talking about, Okay. And if you just keep it, instead of just reading like a parable and kind of isolating that and not putting it in the line of thought, you might come to a certain conclusion, thinking the rapture was there. Okay? So we already determined that no man knows the day or the hour. As he went through and didn't assume anything, referred to the second coming, right? Right. Yeah. So unless you're post-trip, believing the second coming and the rapture are the same thing, you can put those two together and say, well, it's the same thing. Well, I don't, for a lot of reasons that we're going to get to, and we'll see why. Therefore, be on the alert for you to know which day your Lord is coming. That's 42. Now, what he's, and I'm just going to review this and write it up here, okay? So after one's taken and one is left, and that no man knows the day, all right? He goes, and we covered this last time, that's why I'm not going to cover it again, but you can check it. After that, he tells the parable of the good man. Okay, which means head of the house. It has nothing to do with the moral judgment. All right? And that is right after that, which is um, um, Matthew 24, 44 through 51. All the way to the end of the chapter. Remember the parable of the good man? He goes away, and then when he returns unexpectedly, which is links it to no man knows the day or the hour, he gives out both, well actually in, in that parable he just gives out punishment, okay? We talked about how the rapture, there's no punishment, right? There's just rewards up in heaven. So it's keeping that line of thought. Then that went right, and you guys know what the next parable is, right? It's right at the beginning of um, the ten virgins, right? And actually, we kind of took that one apart, didn't we? That's 25, 1 through, I think, 13. Yeah. Okay, and that one, is there reward and punishment? Yeah. The ones that had the oil and were ready went in with them, right, mm -hmm. to the wedding feast. And the ones that weren't ready, what happened to them? They were shut, shut out. out. Shut out. The and it was, I never knew you, right? Which, in if you go to Matthew 7... That's the term he uses when he returns. They said, well, didn't we prophesy in your name and do miracles in your name and do many wonderful works away from me? I never knew you. Okay, so it's not just rebuking a believer. 
there is definitely uh, punishment there, okay? And then we also talked about the, the parable of the ten virgins, that there's no bride, right? This is worth reviewing. That is probably the most puzzling parable that you'll ever come across. But I'm pretty sure this is the right interpretation. The, there's no bride. Why? Because the bride was already taken earlier. That's right. So it's kind of a remnant in there of the rapture. So the rapture, I would tell you, is in the Gospels, but in remnant form. Kind of a hint. And we're, we're going to go over the, those places too later on. But it's not explicitly in there. So, in the parable of the ten virgins, the bride's already taken, and that was for what? The mm -hmm. marriage mm -hmm. ceremony. Mm -hmm. Right? Now... After that, he comes back for the virgins to take them to what? Now, virgin has nothing to do with moral purity, which is the status in the society, okay? Because five are foolish and five get punished. So, when he comes back to that, it's for the wedding feast. Because the ceremony is over, now you have the feast. So, the rapture has happened. And the wedding, when he comes back to the ten virgins, what does that represent? The bridegroom coming back? Where? Let me draw this timeline again. Come on. 260 yeah, days. Yeah, or I'm sorry? So we got the bridegroom right here, didn't he? Yes. Mm -hmm. Rapture. And that's on the... You got the bride. The, I mean, I'm sorry, the bride right there. And that's on what month, what day? The first day, seventh month. First yes. First day, seventh month. First day, seventh month, which is what? <laughs> yeah, and we're going to get into all that. I'm going to give you a handout where not you're going to see a timeline. The feast of not trumpets. Not, uh, feast of feast trumpets. trumpets. So he got that first coming that is not that's implicit in that parable. It's right there, the rapture. And then when the bridegroom comes again, okay, that's going to be where? Right here. The day of atonement, right? Day um, atonement right there. And that's what day? Seventh month. Tenth day. Tenth day. Good. And so that's when he returns. All right. And then we talked about when he comes back for them, what happens? There's a what? According to Revelation 19, there is a wedding feast. <clears throat> the wedding ceremony is over. Now he's going to invite more people to the wedding feast. How long is that? Seven days. Seven days. And just coincidentally, we talked about this, five days after he returns, okay, let me put a big five there. Five days after he returns, on the seventh month, okay? The 15th. The 15th day, okay, right there is the beginning of the millennial kingdom, which is which, which feast? Tabernacles. Tabernacles. And guess how long Tabernacles is in the Bible? Seven days. Seven days. How long is the marriage feast? Seven days. Seven days. Isn't that, isn't that kind of coincidental? When you put all that together, it all matches perfectly when you use the feast template right here. Okay? And does the number seven stand for wholeness again? Yeah, completeness, wholeness. Right. Not, not perfection, but wholeness. Yeah, because Satan and his government has seven heads that come out of the sea in Revelation 13, for instance. Mm -hmm. Which is a a completion or a wholeness of evil. So it just completes it just as one. Which means six means what? Man. Man, because it's a number of incompleteness. And then eight means what? Com New beginnings. New beginnings. New beginnings. <laughs> yes. There you go. So there is kind of a system to all this. So you guys can see all that. So the parable. So we see parable of the good man. He returns. There's punishment, parable of the ten virgins, there's punishment and reward. And then we get to the one after that, there is the parable of the talents. Uh, the talents. Exactly. All right. Which is not a talent like, you know, you talk about someone has an ability to do anything. Now, what's the difference between a talent and a gift? Talent is given. No. Both are. In a sense, both are, right? Yeah. So what's the difference between a talent and a gift? Talent, 
The difference between talent and a gift is talent you get at birth, gift you get when you're reborn. God gives you, oh, you go. gifts of the Spirit when you're reborn. Second difference is this, and this is where a lot of people mess up, is talents do not necessarily tell you the direction you need to go to fulfill your ministry. Whereas gifts definitely tell you where you fulfill your ministry. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So people say, oh man, I'm a great uh, whatever. I'm a great uh, saxophone player. You know, they've been playing all the lives and they get saved and they, I know God wants to use a saxophone, you know, too. But it could be, I mean, it could be God could use that talent, right? But not necessarily. We'll see the parable of the talents, which is um, Matthew uh, 25, what is that, uh, 14 through 30. He gives them talents, and the one that had five made five more. The one that had two made two more, and the one that had only had one was punished. Okay? And actually, his stuff is given to the ones who had five talents. All right? So that all leads up to not a parable, okay? But it leads up to an, the actual event, the line of thought from no man, one taken, one left, no man knows the day, the hour. All that leads us to what it's talking about, okay? So let's go into that. So that's Matthew 25, okay, 31 through 46. The sheep and goat judgment, as it's called, all right? And here's what it says. All right, so Matthew 25, what did I say, 31? Yes. Okay, but when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glo glorious throne. Obviously, that's what? Judgment. The end time. I mean, the second coming. Yes, thank you. It's the second <laughs> coming because he's coming and he will <laughs> sit on his glorious throne. Now, right now, there's some things that are out of place or not yet fulfilled. Like, for instance, is Jesus sitting on his throne right now? now yeah. You, you know upstairs. how I like to treat people. He's on the right hand of God. Yes. Father. Yeah, so he's more technically on his father's throne, at his right hand. He's not on his throne. His throne is going to be here initially on this earth for a thousand years. Let me take another excursion. Of course, remember my theory about um, the mercy seat. What was that? What was the mercy seat? When they made the Ark of the Covenant, all that, what was that? Anyone know? Sitting on the wings. Yeah, it had the cherubim on there. But where did the where did this mercy seat go? The Holy of Holies. Yeah. Yeah. But what what was it on top of? What piece of Ark of the Covenant? Yeah. Covenant. Yeah, the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, we're talking about how that's probably a seat, and I kind of think that's his throne when he comes back. Now, that begs a question. Listen to this. Jeremiah 3, 16 and 17, I'll read it. I'll tell you what I think. And it shall come to pass when you be multiplied and increased in the land in those days, says the Lord, they shall say no more. Here's what the people of Israel are saying. The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. Neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it. Wow. They're running around visiting it and they're, they're shouting out that they're all excited about the Ark of the Lord. That's interesting. Neither shall that be done anymore. At that time, they should have called Jerusalem the throne of God. And all nations shall be gathered unto it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. That's obviously talking about when he returns. Okay, that, that they were going around saying the ark of the, of, the, of the Lord. It's because probably the ark is going to be discovered or unveiled soon. And if they have the ark, what did they have to have? The God of the temple. Yeah. But the ark has been found supposedly. I know. The cross. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 And so I just think that they have it. They just haven't, haven't unveiled it. Right. But once they do, now they got reason to so build the temple. To, yeah. They got reason to build the temple. Mm -hmm. And once, and of course that has to do with Daniel 9.27. The Antichrist makes a covenant with Israel, right? Mm-hmm. Dealing with sacrifices and offerings. And also in Ezekiel, it talks about the Antichrist is going to build a wall between the holy and the profane up there on the Temple Mount. So some people put that all together and say, here's what he's going to do. 
He's going to put uh, wall up where the Arabs have, you know, their mosque or whatever that is, dome of, uh, what is it? Dome, uh, dome of the rock. rock. Yeah, up there. And then we'll put up a wall right here, and it's right there that you guys are going to build your temple. Could be. They're running around saying the Ark of the Covenant. That's Jeremiah 3, 16 and 17. And they would only be doing that, as far as I could tell, is if they found it or if they unveil it. Like you say, I'm like Steve, I, I just think they know where it is. But you can't just bring it out any time. You know, <laughs> you create World War III yes. if you do that. Yes. So in Jeremiah, when he's talking, they've already been put into Babylon? In Jeremiah, yes. Uh -huh. And so the, the temple doesn't have the ark. It never had the ark again, no matter what, right? They yeah. never had the ark. What? Yeah, one of the theories is that Jeremiah himself, mm -hmm. when the Babylonians came yeah. in, it gets real into, he talked about a pillar that was on the front, mm -hmm. and then it gives the measurements, and then later on, after the Babylonians come in, the, the, the pillar is like shorter. Mm -hmm. Like what? And Boaz, and whatever the, the pillar his name was, it means like uh, like uh, weights and levers and all that, and they said, well, there was this trap door under the Holy of Holies, and it went down under, and Jeremiah himself took it and whisked it away in the underground tunnels, which could have, maybe, and maybe, like we talked about before, it ended up under where Jesus crucified and his blood actually dipped yeah. down the cross onto the, the seat of mercy. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's incredible. That's our God. Yeah. yeah, that's our God. And remember on the cross itself, the little cross beam that he could pull himself up on? The little two by four was called the what? The, the, the mercy seat. And I think in the New Testament it's called propitiation. That's what they use in the Septuagint for mercy seat. Propitiation, that Greek word. So it, it gets really involved. But when we get to heaven, it's all put together. We're going to be like, wow, <laughs> that is amazing. It says this, so he's going to sit on his glorious throne. Now there's three groups of people in the sheep and goat judgment. Okay? There's three groups of people, and we should look at those. Everybody okay if I erase this? Yeah. Okay. Three groups of people. Besides Jesus, obviously, the king himself in the judging. Okay? There is who? Come on. The sheep and goat judgment. Uh -huh. Name a group of people. The sheep. The sheep. The sheep. There you go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> See, it, it, I trick you guys so much that when I ask an obvious question, everybody's like, uh, he's tricking us again. No, I'm not. The sheep, the goats, the goats and what other group of people does it mention? Where? It says when he calls the people, the holy No, no, no. I mean explicitly he calls them my brethren. Okay? Yeah. We're in Matthew 25 you. and the sheep and goat judgment. Okay, and I'm going to read it. So there's those three groups of people. All right? Mm -hmm. And we're going to determine what they represent here in a second. All right? Because this is the often quoted uh, text of Scripture, like for prison ministries. Or, and, and, hey, I, I love prison ministries or helping people overseas as naked, you clothe me, poor people. Um, but let's see what it is in context. Okay. Let me read through verse 31. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory... And all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glow glorious throne. And all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right, which of course the, that's the position of honor and strength, and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, and feed you, or thirsty, and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger, and invite you in, or naked, and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and said to them, Truly, I say to the extent that you did it to one of these, my, these brethren of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. All right? So who does he, he calls the sheep his, his what? Righteous. Righteous, righteous ones. 
So I'm going to call this the sheets are the, and, and, and what time period did they come and do all this stuff? The tribulation period, right? Yeah. 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 So, if we're going to call this Gentile believers, okay? Oops. Believers. Now, my brethren, what do you think group that is? Remember, put it in the context. What's the tribulation period about? Is it about the Jews. The Jews. The Jews. The Jews. The Jews. Causing them to repent, yes. turn back to their God, which happens three days before Jesus returns. As in Hosea, the end of the last two verses of chapter 5 and the first verse of chapter 6. Okay? Three days before, they're going to petition him to come back. Now, my brethren is who? Who do you think? The Jews. The Jews. Yes. Yes, Who's the Jews. Who's going to petition Jesus? The Jews are going to petition Jesus yes. to come back? Yes. That's Hosea, the end of chapter 5, beginning of chapter 6. Hosea 5, 6. Yeah. And they say a prayer where they repent three days before and call. For, they realize, oh my gosh. Because God said he was going to return back to his place. Now, for God to return to his place, that means he had to leave it, right? Yes. That's Jesus coming. God. And then he returned back to his place. And then when they repent and they petition him, remember, he said, he said to the Jewish leaders, you're not going to, you're not going to see me until you say what? Mm-hmm. Yes. As long as in Baruch Chabab Hashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In other words, you're going to acknowledge me and know that I'm the Messiah and you're going to repent. Okay? <clears throat> so, so it's, it's based upon their treatment of the Jews. So I'm going to call this Gentile believers since we have the Jews here. And so what do you think the goats are? Gentile what? Non-believers. Non-believers, yes. Exactly. Non-believers. Okay? So, so that's what that is. So in our conversation yesterday, yes. when we talked about the sheep and the goats, we kind of said like five of the virgins were... The smart ones with the oil, they were the sheep on the right side. Mm-hmm. The other five were not so smart, didn't have the oil, they were the goats on yes. the left side. Yes. So all ten of those virgins are all Gentiles. Yes. Probably if you line everything up, you know, punishment and reward, and then you get to the actual event to kind of decipher and go back. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And then <laughs> it kind of makes things clear. All right? And again, it, it puts things in the context. My main point is, all this line of thought of one taken, one left, no man knows the day of the hour, refers to what event? The second coming. The second coming. I, it seems like I'm always hammering that home, but I'm telling you, as soon as you guys get out of here and you talk to somebody, oh, he's a pastor. Oh, gosh. What? What? That guy took that thing, things out of context? Oh, he did? Okay. I guess I was fooled. That's why I'm saying, look at it yourself. And you determine. Okay? I just think that a lot of people miss it because of a preconceived notion. Hey Ed, real quick, why yes. don't the Jews accept the Lord as their Savior? Why won't they? Yeah. Oh, why won't they quick. Yeshua? Yeah. Yeah, because uh, Paul said in, now I'll give you the spiritual reason, because it's all lining up, right? And even the Essenes in the Red, uh, the, the Dead Sea, you know, their community, their Dead Sea Scrolls were found and all that, if you read the writings, they had it pinned down exactly all things about the Messiah, which they now deny. But the reason, according to Paul in 11, is he goes a mystery. He says a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. So in other words, it was God's plan, not his fault. He didn't cause them to, but he knew they were going to reject his Messiah and that 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 hardening would happen, and then that opens the door for what? For the, the church to be. The church. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But he put scales on their eyes, yeah. yes. basically. Right. There's scales yeah, on their right. eyes. Until mm-hmm. when? But there's a duration to that. Until? The fullness of the church. Yes, which is? The rapture. The rapture, which takes you into the tribulation period where they repent. You see, you see how all that works? Mm-hmm. How all that fits together? Yeah. So yeah, that's the spiritual reason. Okay. But but they always like Isaiah fifty three talks about you know um, about how he a man of sorrow is acquainted with grief 
how he was beaten and whipped and you know you know not for his own sin everything you know it's all obvious but then when the Jews look at that the way they interpret that is well that's referring to Israel as how Israel has been persecuted and they're correct typologically okay but they don't get the Peshat what it's directly talking about because that blindness has happened to them yeah but at this point the brethren his brethren the Jews these are the ones that are being persecuted that are imprisoned naked and hungry and I suspect it's the ones that have repented oh okay. and go because the kingdom is basically the very Jewish flavor the Gentiles coming in and all that obviously so um, yeah, partial hardening has happened to Israel. Mm -hmm. I think that's 1125. Mm -hmm. And until, I, I say, until there's a duration, until the fullness of the Gentiles comes mm -hmm. in, because the church is seen as a, as a Gentile mechanism, even though it's both Jew and Gentile. It's seen mainly as a Gentile bride for Yeshua, you know, that type of thing. So okay. when Christ was crucified, they were already blinded. The oh, yeah. had already it, been put on. Yes. Because mm -hmm. they wouldn't have done it. So yes. the scales well, have been on for a long time. Right? The 2,000 well, years. Yeah. But 2,000 years, basically. When Jesus was mm. uh, prosecuted, the, gen the people that were out there in, in the square mm -hmm. were not the same Jews that welcomed him into the city. Those mm -hmm. people were yeah. preparing the Passover lamb. Yes. And they had so, the temple rituals. So they the were the ones that were being righteous. The the people that were yelling for Barabbas to be freed and for Jesus to be to be crucified were not doing what the law ordered them to do. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, so mm -hmm. everything about the trial of Jesus, everything was violated. I mean, go through the whole thing, you know. Isn't it funny? I have this theory that he was crucified in the year thirty. You know why? Because 2030 would be exactly 2,000 years, and that's where I'm going to tell you he will return to the second coming. It's going to be exactly 2,000 years from when they crucified him or rejected him to 2030, and that's the year of Jubilee. When I, uh, I'll share all that later, but it's like everything just lines up. It does. I mean, it's like, are you kidding me? But it, it does line up. Anyways, so. Now, let's see here. So, so now you kind of see the flow of the passage of Matthew 24 through 25. Okay? Everybody knows what no man knows the day or the hour is. And then I was going to go to some Luke passages on his, um, on, the com on the second coming. But the one I want to go to is this. This is really interesting. This is Luke 19, 11 through 27. Okay? Luke 19, 11 through 27. So now, when you go through the parables and the Gospels, you kind of have a better handle of what it refers to. We just put the rapture in there so many times. And it's not in there. But when you go through Luke 11, 19, 11, let me find it real quick. It's going to shock you if you really realize the import of this and what... Um, the rewards are okay. 1911, and they, and while they were listening to these things, he went to tell them a parable, because he was near Jerusalem, and they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately, which is the messianic kingdom or the millennial kingdom. That's what he came for initially, and that's what they were expecting. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. And he called ten. Oh, there's that number again. Ten virgins, ten slaves when the master left the house. And now another one, he's calling ten of his slaves and gave him ten miles and said, do business with this until I come back. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. And it came about when he returned after receiving the kingdom, he ordered that these slaves to whom he had given money be called to him in order that he might know what business they had done. The first appeared saying, Master, your Maya has made ten, ten Mayas more. And he said, Well done, because you have been faithful in the very little thing. Be in authority over ten cities. Isn't that funny? Ten cities, as in... When you get into the millennial kingdom, you're not just going to be doing nothing. 
if you were faithful, guess what? You have authority like the mayor or over wow. 10 cities. Because it's an earthly kingdom with cities and wow. towns. Get it? So this is kind of shocking to me. And the second king saying, your master has made five more. And he says, you're over five cities. And then one he puts in the handkerchief and stuff. So the actual reward there is, and then there's punishment. And there's reward. And the reward is actually cities. So it says we're going to rule and reign with them. So we come back with them as the church. We have spiritual authority probably over certain regions or cities or whatever. But the people here on this earth are actually over cities and regions too. Okay? So it's going to be a very orderly kingdom because our God is a God of order. All right? Um, so I, again, I just found that kind of a interesting when you put that with everything else. Now... So, just to reiterate the point, when we go through the Gospels, whether it's Matthew 24 and 25, or any of the parables and any of the Gospels, I think we make a mistake that's a very common mistake. And that is sometimes we superimpose a future doctrine back on a previous text when nobody knew about that doctrine. Got that? Like John chapter 3. Remember Nick at night, Nicodemus? He went and came and visited Jesus at night. And then it says, Jesus said, you must be born of water and the Spirit. And there are certain denominations that say, see, baptism. <clears throat> That's water baptism. You have to be baptized, right? But not to be saying. saved. That wasn't what he was saying. That well, was earth. He's saying you can't even see the kingdom of God without that. I mean, you could distally make that, but that, that's not even the point. And it's this. When Paul ran into some disciples in Acts 19, they were only acquainted with the baptism of John. And so what did he do? He baptized them. And that's all they had in John chapter 3 was the baptism of John. So he put it in context. So does that mean that our Christian baptism is the same as the baptism of John? No. Why would Paul baptize people who had already had, in Acts 19, the baptism of John the Baptist? It was the same thing. You see what I'm saying? So he wasn't even talking about the same kind of baptism. Wow. But we superimpose a doctrine that's given later on, mm -hmm. and we put it back into a text, like in the Gospels, and then we come to a conclusion, put things in a timeline, in a context, right? Because, was the church a mystery? Yes. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't even created or made until when? After the resurrection. Yeah, after the resurrection in Acts yeah. chapter... Three. Two. Two, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, or the Greek says, when the day of Pentecost was being fulfilled. Ooh, that's kind of interesting. The day of Pentecost is being fulfilled, as in those feasts are prophecies, and this is the fulfillment of that Pentecost. You know, right there. So, and then not only that, I always quote this, 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. And what's that mystery he tells us in the resurrection chapter, 1 Corinthians 15? It is the mystery of the... Rapture. Yes. <laughs> Look at it yourself. And of course, Acts 17, 11. What does that say? Mm -hmm. I forget. Bill. It says something. Something. Searching the scriptures. Yes. Yeah, sure yeah, that's true. Those in uh, Berea were more noble minded than those in Thessalonica. Because they readily heard everything the Apostle Paul said, but then they searched the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Mm -hmm. So you guys have to get that all this cemented down into your mind. That's, that's why I spent all this time on this one section, because once I get into it, that one thing will come to your mind. Well, no man knows the day of the hour. Let's take a look at the Noah and Lot models. And we're going to find some surprising things. There's some things that are the same and some things that are different. They don't refer to exactly the same thing. Okay? So, in Luke 24 and Luke 17, one's taken, one's left. Okay? So, yeah, that's Luke 17, 34 through 36, and Matthew 24, 40 through 41. Okay? 
So one's taken and one is left. So remember, I, I've been building up this long time. I've told you the answer. And I said, okay, I'm going to actually give you the scripture for that. And just so you know, I just went through this myself and just kind of put it all together. And then I went into like commentaries and a lot of them have the same interpretation. So it's not something that's really far out. This is a very legitimate position, okay? Or like um, the Bible Knowledge Commentary from DTS, mm -hmm. Dallas Theological Seminary. When they went, I went and read that on the Ten Virgins. Guess what? They said, well, that's not the rapture. That's the second coming. This is the line of thought before and the line of thought after. So if you take things in context, you have to come to that conclusion. So, and then Luke, okay, um, 17... 34 through 36. Okay, that's the one taken, one's left. So, if that's not the rapture, where are they taking, taken, and where's the scripture for this? Right? That's what you should be asking. Okay? They're taken, you're saying something about Armageddon or whatever, but is there scripture to show that? Okay? First, we're going to look at the, right here, we'll look at the Noah model. All right, and in that, and that is uh, Matthew 24, 37 through 39, and then we're going to look at the Lot model, okay, and that one only occurs in the book of Luke, okay, he doesn't mention it elsewhere, 17, 28 through 30. But he mentions both in conjunction about how it's going to be when he returns. But I'm going to tell you that they refer to different events. When you kind of lump everything together and make it one big blob, then you don't distinguish between what he's trying to tell us. But I'm going to try to break it down and see what the differences are, okay? And what the, um, okay? And I'll just start, I'll go easy on this first part and then we'll quit so we have time for prayer, okay? Now, in both of these, there is a same pattern, okay? And that pattern is careless ease. Then you have judgment, okay? Careless ease and then judgment. And But the time period that it refers to is different, all right? Matthew 24, 37 through 39. But as the days of Noah were, so 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 shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. From those days before the flood. Before the flood. So that's before the great tribulation period. Okay? Before the last three and a half years. Because the flood is not his coming. That's the judgment on them. Everybody got that clear? Mm -hmm. Okay. They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving to marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So you got ease, careless ease. You got the flood and then the coming of the Son of Man. All right? So careless ease and the Noah model. Right there. Matthew 24, 37 through 39. All right? And the Lot model is the days of Lot. All right? And then up at the, yeah, Luke 17, 28 through 30. All right. Likewise, also, it was in the days of Lot. They did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, and they built it. The same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus, it shall be in the day that the Son of Man is revealed. So prosperity, okay, uh, careless ease. They have careless ease and then judgment. But when that judgment comes, we're going to see it's a not exactly the same judgment. Because up here, it was the tribulation, the great tribulation the last three and a half years. Down here, we're going to see what it correlates to, okay? Now, there's also different reasons for the judgment, okay? In the Noah model, what was the reason for that? Two reasons. The wickedness of the Yes. The wickedness, it talks about corruption and, and violence. Right here, the reason for it was, I would say, Genesis 6-4, the Nephilim. And then in verse 5, 
It was the <coughs> wickedness of man. God bless you. Right. So, Nephilim and the wickedness, so very much a corruption. All right? And then in the Noah model, we actually have to. Yeah, it says this. I'll read the verses real quick. There were giants or Nephilim in the earth in those days, talking about the Noah model. And also after that, after what? After the flood, there were Nephilim. And I think that also the model, as in, as in the days of Noah, I'm not <laughs> sure that we're going to see the return of the Nephilim. Okay? I think they're already, yeah, they're already here. <laughs> but they are. And we're going to see really room wild again, just like in the days of Noah. That's why he had to do the flood, because Close enough, thanks. You know, there would have been no full humans left. There's only eight left. They were all on the ark. Okay? Now, it says in verse 5, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Which, of course, is not true today, right? Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, right. Wrong. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty... Uh, <laughs> the, all the conditions that he had to destroy the whole earth are happening again. Now, in the Lot model, the uh, the thing that, that brought the judgment was... And it's not even in... That, what do you think it was? Look, I'm not even going to write that down. The, what brought the judgment? Writing? You have to go to Ezekiel. He heard, a cry. They, he heard them cry out, right? Yeah, the, yeah, the, the cry to Sodom to reach up into the heavens. Mm -hmm. Which interestingly enough, that's what it says about Babylon. Which I'm going to correlate those two here. But what was there, the sin of Sodom? It's, okay, here's where it tells you the sin of Sodom. Ezekiel 16, 49. Oh, okay? Here's what it is. Three things. Ready? Behold, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. Number one was pride. pride which we, okay? They're, they're very proud. Number two is fullness of bread. Okay? Fullness of bread. B-R-E-A-D? Yes. B -R -E -A -D. B -R -E -A -D. Yeah, yeah. Fullness of bread. Okay? And then number three, abundance of idleness. You know what that speaks of? An affluent, prosperous society. Mm -hmm. Usually you're just, you're just, you know, working all the time just to make enough for you and your family to survive. When you have this the fullness of bread, it means there's plenty of food, and you have a lot of time off, abundant idleness. Okay? But... It goes on. It says, Neither did she, this is the result, strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. Mm. So, very affluent, prosperous society, but they didn't reach out and help their fellow man. Okay? That's right. They're not and doing so, it now either. Yeah. <laughs> Again, <laughs> that's exactly my point. Look at the conditions during the days of Noah. Look at the conditions of the days of Lot. Are we there? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> both of them. We are there in both of them. So, is judgment coming? Oh, yes. well. Yes. I'd be shocked if it does. I think that the only reason we're not destroyed is because God is so patient, you know, and He still has a purpose to accomplish, you know, in these last few oh, are days. I'm sorry? We are destroyed. Yeah. Our, our country is destroyed. We're destroyed yeah. from the yeah. inside. Does yeah. It? I mean, morally. We are. Economically, we are destroyed. Yeah. We're just paper mache right now, correct? Yeah. That is, is really nothing. We're just a puppet. Right. We're just paper mache. Mm -hmm. And what is it like, a, you know, Wiley Coyote when he runs out over the cliff and then he realizes what he did and then he kind of feels under him and there's nothing under there? And then what happens? He keeps and you see a big puff of smoke. Yeah, that's kind of where we're at. To me, the post-trip rapture is very much a result of Americanism. In other words, you live in a very, well, we live <laughs> Ezekiel 1649, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We're prosperous. And I think, man, I'm poor. Are you kidding me? I live in a mansion. I got five bedrooms, you know? Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's amazing. But I just think that um, we think, well, you know, the church is not ready for Christ to come back, which denies our position in Christ. You know, we're fat, we're lazy, we're weak, so we got to kind of work out. In other words, we got to go through the tribulation period and get us ready for Christ. 
Well, see, that's Americanism because most of the church around this world, in fact, I heard a, a statistics that more Christians have been martyred this century, only 22 years into it than any other century before. Mm. But we just don't experience it here. So we have that American, you know, mentality yeah. that, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? God loves us so much that he will allow us to go through persecution. Learn to embrace when you can suffer for Christ. You know, when the apostles were whipped by the Jewish leaders, they went away, what? Crying? Whining? Rejoicing. No, rejoicing, rejoicing that they were counted worthy, what? To suffer, to suffer for Christ. That's the right attitude. Okay? We just don't experience it here, here, but we will. We will. And it's not as though, like James says, some strange thing were That's happening right. to you. Surprise. Surprise. Yeah. yeah, it's like, no, this is what... If it's not happening, you should be surprised. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Even now, it's a very mild one. You know what I'm saying? Like, if I talk about Christ, someone gets mad at me. I mean, they hadn't yelled at work at me before and stuff. Like, just blanket my, you know, big deal. That doesn't hurt me. Right. You know? And I don't care. Um, I mean, I do care for the people and stuff. But I'm not, none of us are really facing severe, it's like he said in the book of Hebrews, you haven't resisted to the shedding of blood at this point, have you? Has anybody done that? We are, but we're going to, I think, I really feel this way, before the rapture, we'll get to enter into it for one reason again, that's because God loves us that much. He won't deny that from us, which I think is great. Again, not that I have a death wish or anything, but that's, that's kind of the way it goes. So, we'll, we'll finish all this up next time about the two models. So you might read those verses in Matthew and in Luke. Matthew 24 and in Luke 17, go over it and say, what's the differences? What do they refer to? What's the same thing? You know? And as you go through and compare that, you might come across some amazing discoveries. Matthew what? Okay. Matthew 24. 24 I'm sorry. 37 and 39. Th 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 39. Just the old chapter. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah, just read, <laughs> read all of Luke 17, all of Matthew 24. And then... It's amazing because it, there's an, if, the, if you really look at the scriptures closely, break it down, string pearls together, put scriptures together, there's an amazing message there. And it's, he's telling us specific things.